wherever you're watching from, you are welcome to this powerful service. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall be glad and rejoice in it. So get some space, invite a friend, invite a relative, invite a sibling. Come into your living room or wherever you're watching from, and let's praise the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Are you ready? Get your groove on, get your space to get your bounce on. All right. Side to side. Hey, are you ready for this one? Ha! My dear brothers and sisters, step by. Let nothing move you except the beat. Hey, you there without no roots. Are you a backslider? I said, you there without no roots. Are you a backslider? Check it. Let go of Sunday faith. Let go of shallow faith. Let go of divided faith. Let go of stagnant faith. Don't be overconfident. Live on by company. Let go of all the friends and all your disappointments. Hey, my fool no worship. We did it again. Yes, sir. We did it again. My fool no worship. We did it again. Hey, praise God. We did it again. My fool no worship. We did it again. Praise God. We did it again. My fool no worship. We did it again. Let's sing this together. Say.
have this solid ground. And because he's asking us to give of ourselves, we choose to follow the one and only King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the one who sits on the right hand of the Father. Through and through, we make this promise. We make this promise as a people. Lord, if you can hear us, I know you can hear us, oh God. could do it, thought that I could make it, thought that I could build it on my own, but I've come to see that, but I've come to see that, as I've tried to fill the void, nothing else can fill the hole.
Wow, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you're watching from. It's such a joy to be together again uh, at the end of another week, coming into uh, the place where we worship God together. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in that amazing time of worship. And you know, as we come uh, today, uh, I'm just so excited to, to welcome every one of you into God's house. My name is Pastor M. Moredi um, Wanjao, Senior Pastor of the Mavuno Movement of Churches. And it is my joy to welcome, especially for those of you who are joining us for the first time, your first time to come and to be with us as a family online. Uh, We're so grateful to have you here in the Mavuno online service. And uh, we would love to uh, get to know a little more about you, how we can pray for you. So use the, the, the link on your screen and just tell us a bit about yourself, where you are especially, and how we can even be praying for you. And we would love to be in prayer for you uh, this week that is coming. And in addition to that, if uh, you are here, maybe it's your first time or you've been coming for a little while, but you'd like to join one of our online discipleship groups, let us know as well. Use the same link. Let us know. And we would love to connect you with community, like-minded, same values community that will help you become everything God wants you to become. And so we're, we're really looking forward to uh, what God has for us today. Uh, one of the things that uh, we do whenever we worship, like when we come, we come to, uh, together to worship, is that we give of our tithes and our offerings. And as we are doing so, and as I know that uh, that information is coming up on your screen right now, but I want to just uh, share something that really inspired me as I thought about uh, why we need to give and how, we, actually, more, less of the how, uh, the how, and it becomes, the why, and it becomes more of the how. How does God want us to give? And you know, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, it's got this amazing little scripture that I just find, such, it's such a, such an attitude scripture. It's kind of like the way God wants us to think, live our lives. And I believe that giving fits into that as well. It says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And you know, I really do believe that God wants us as we come, every time we come into his presence, to come with rejoicing, like continual rejoicing to come in an attitude of prayer. You know, it's like we're here for a supernatural encounter, but also to come in an attitude of thanksgiving. And as we give our tithes and offerings, that's my prayer, is that this is what's going to characterize our giving uh, going forward. It's like it's always out of joy. Look at what the Lord has done. It's always out of prayer. My goodness, this is not just a, it's not a contribution. This is a supernatural encounter. My giving is a part of, it's, it's a part of my thanksgiving as well to this amazing God who's been so faithful and gracious to me as well. And so I just want to pray for us as we give our tithes and our offerings. Father, thank you uh, for this day. Thank you for another time to worship you. It's such a joy. The word says, I rejoiced when they say to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And Lord, we have the privilege today of being in your house. We have the privilege uh, of worshiping you together, whether uh, we are alone or uh, where we're watching this or whether we're in a community, uh, as many are. I just pray that, Lord, you would bless us greatly. I pray that, Lord, as we give, that this would actually be what is happening in our hearts right now, rejoicing, prayer, uh, thanksgiving, that these things would characterize everything that we do. And Father, we pray that these gifts we give, that Lord, they will be used to bless and continue spread your work across the earth. And that Lord, you will be glorified by our faithfulness. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, we are uh, really look, looking forward, and I'm really looking forward to God's word. I pray that you are as well. As we start, I want to ask you a question. What is one extremely useful technology or tool that has made your life a lot easier. It could be an app, it could be a technology, it could be some tool. What is one extremely useful technology tool or app that has made your life a lot easier? Can you think of something right now? Uh, maybe you can shout it out if you're with friends, uh, like just, uh, just, just shout out your own answer. Uh, and you know, it's uh, like I know there are so many answers, but maybe there's just one particularly for you. I mean, I asked this question on my social media uh, and I got some really good answers. One, one huge one was artificial intelligence. I think we live in that age of chat GPT. Uh, chat GPT just helping people to do almost any task you can imagine, whether it's writing CVs to job applications to, to recipes for something to cook for dinner to doing your homework. I mean, it's just become a, a lifelong companion for many people. Uh, I think they're designing like virtual 
companions now, like friends for life kind of thing. I, in a little while, I suspect we're going to be marrying computers, or you're going to be ask, people are going to be asking their pastors to do their weddings with their, their computer companion. Uh, Canva is another one. I mean, people really talked about, uh, what, uh, that's another artificial intelligence that has turned so many people into designers. You didn't, you, you, everyone has design skills nowadays uh, because of some of these tools we, uh, that are out there. And, you know, it's so interesting because there are so many tools. We live in a, a, a world that has technologies that our ancestors would have considered to be magic or witchcraft. I mean, for real, when you talk about things like ChatGPT, it helps people do almost anything they want to do. Like we talked about Canva just now, helps turn everyone into a designer. But there are also other tools that maybe are not so, you know, they may not look as current, but they're just as vital. What would we be today without Zoom? Or WhatsApp? Like just think about life without WhatsApp. It's such a essential tool nowadays. Google Maps, like seriously, like nobody even needs to be told where to go anymore. Just put in your, your gadget and it takes you there. Or M-Pesa. I mean, think about M-Pesa. It's like, how would life operate in this country without M-Pesa? Uh, Google and, and YouTube. I mean, some of these things have become almost, you don't even think of them as technology anymore. They're just life tools that are so useful. And I don't know, some of you may, may not remember this, but some of us grew up in a time when there's only one TV station in this country. And basically, it was like, you have to wait for TV to start at five in the evening. What a shock. Like some of you are thinking, what? Because today you can stream any movie or documentary that you want through Netflix and many other streaming apps that exist. And don't even get me started on gadgets like smartphones and earbuds. It's like, what? <laughs> you know, I was thinking about this another day and I was thinking about the time I grew up, and this is going to show you how old I am. I mean, I remember growing up in an age where in high school, my friends would like compete to get the newspaper uh, on Sundays and cut out the latest music hits. The songs would be printed there and people would cut them out and put them in little black books and, and stick them with glue. And then you'd like have your copy of all the lyrics of the latest songs. I mean, what does that tell you? This is like the Stone Age, you know. And then after that, it's like if you found somebody that had the latest music, it will be on something called a cassette. And I don't even know how to explain a cassette tape for those of you who never saw it. Uh, you have to Google it so that you see what it looked like. And then you'd have to make a copy of it. You know, it's like somebody would have to have one uh, player or deck and then somebody else would have another one. You connect them and then you play and then you record. My gosh, today you just need to type the song into Spotify. And boom, <laughs> any song in the world on the day of its release. It's like, it's crazy when you think about it, right? It's like we have more access as a generation to information than any other generation that ever existed on this planet. And, and, and you would think that with such access to such knowledge, to such information, it would result in us becoming like the happiest and wisest generation that ever existed. I mean, that's what you'd think, right? But the irony is that with all the knowledge and all the technology that's available to solve problems today, people are actually more stressed out and more depressed than back in the day when the tools didn't exist. It's like young people are more prone to depression and societal disorders. Our families are more prone to being broken and to experiencing divorce early on in their marriage life. Uh, the reality is that despite all these tools that are designed to make our lives easier, people work more hours they rest less, they are more likely to experience dissatisfaction and anxiety in life. Like, what a shock. Like, who would have thought that would be the result of having all these things? And the question we have to ask is, is there a way to navigate life so that we end up with less stress, less anxiety, and more joy? I mean, it's like the more information we get, the, the more overwhelmed we become. And that's what we want to talk about today. Fortunately, the word actually talks about stuff like this, and I'm really excited. Now, for our visitors, we are going through a series uh, called Roadmaps, and really what we are asking is, is there a way, is there a, a tool, is there a roadmap we can follow that will help us safely reach our intended destination in life? And each week of the series, we've been looking at some proverbs, uh, the wise sayings written by King Solomon, the wisest man of his time, and we've learned that there are some powerful principles to help us navigate through life. The first one we learned was the principle of the path. And what that one says is a very simple, very profound principle. It says every path has a destination. And it's not your intention that will get you where you're going. It's your direction. It doesn't matter if you're pointed in the wrong direction. You know, if you're, if you're racking up debt and living a lavish lifestyle, you know, you may want to have financial freedom, but it's not your want or your desire that will get you there. It's the path that you're currently on. 
If you're a workaholic and you're spending large chunks of your time at work, you may desire that you want to have a beautiful and amazing family that is content and love each other, but your path that you're on, it's not leading you there. And so we talked about the fact that it's not about intention or desire. It's really about the path and the direction you're on. And then we talked about the principle of danger signs. And we said that the prudent, they see danger and they take refuge. But the simple, they keep going and they pay the penalty. So, so prudent people are wise people and they see danger coming and they immediately take course-correcting actions. But simple or foolish people, either they ignore the danger or they see it uh, or they don't even see it at all. They just pass it without understanding it. See, danger signs are all around. Your financial situation right now is an indicator of all the decisions you've been making financially until today. So right now, your, your, your balance sheet, your, your, what's in your account, that should tell you it's actually a result. It, you didn't happen there by accident. You didn't just get there. It's a result. It's a danger sign for some of you because it tells you that I'm on the wrong track. I'm not heading where I'm supposed to be going. Your children are a great indicator today of your parenting decisions until now. The state of your marriage, it's an indicator of the marriage decisions you've been making until now. Now, things don't magically correct themselves. And what we've been learning is, you know what? A wise person, they see danger signs and they take evasive action. Now, today we want to build on from there. And I hope you're finding that this is an amazing series. I really think this is a great series for us at an end of a year to just reflect on the wisdom that we need to make sure that we succeed in our goals. And you know what? We're asking today ourselves the question, how do we avoid being overwhelmed by all the information and all the options out there and still end up making the best decision every time? Now, I want you to imagine that somebody gave you like a database, this magical artificial intelligence database that could tell you every decision that you could ever make, whether it's a dating decision, financial decision, parenting decision, professional decision. Imagine you could put that information, key it in, and it tells you all the possible outcomes of the decision you want to make. So it's like you're thinking about three girls that you like. Okay, maybe you don't like three girls. Maybe you just like two. Uh, and, 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 and you're thinking, okay, I could marry this person, or I could marry this person, or I could stay single. Okay, all these are my options. Key it in, and it gives you all the multitude of potential options, and it ranks them from best to worst. Or if you, it's, it's, like, it's like, you know, if you choose this one, you're going to be extremely happy. If you choose this one, chances are you're not going to be happy. I mean, that would be awesome, isn't it? Like this computer could just help you decide of all the options facing me, this is the one that will lead to happiness in life. And you know what? It would be a very good thing on paper. Because somehow, most of us, we truly believe that the bad decisions we make in life is because we lack the right information. And we feel like if I just had the right information, I would always make those big life decisions better. But here's the thing I want you to understand today. That's not always true. When it comes to money, we probably have more information than anybody has ever had, any other generation has ever had, right? There are more sermons about it. We are more exposed to them. You can go on YouTube and find every sermon that was ever preached about money. There are more programs than ever before courses to teach you about money. There's more information out there for free on the internet about it. But today, more people are still failing to master money and are retiring broke. So it's not about information. Uh, when it comes to family and to raising kids, the data is all around us. There's so much information. You can go out there and learn. You know, you can look at your life and the life of your neighbors. You can, you can go online and find out which families turn out well, which ones don't, and what are the things to do to make a difference. The information is out there. And yet, even with all that information, you still find that it doesn't stop parents from making poor decisions today. And if you talk to teachers, you'll actually be amazed to find out that today they are dealing with a lot worse problems than they were dealing with just five years ago. It's like our parenting is actually deteriorating despite the fact that we have more information to help us make better decisions. And so what I put it to you is that even if you had a supercomputer that could spit out all the predictability factors and help you understand how your decisions will turn out, somehow we would still not make good decisions. Why? Because our problem is not lack of information. Our problem is not lack of information. Our passage today kind of wrestles with that tension. And I'm going to be going, taking us into the word today because as I said earlier, we're looking at King Solomon and the sayings that he, he, the wise sayings in the book of Proverbs. And the backstory of Solomon is when he became king, he, God gave him a blank check. As a young guy, God gave him this blank check and God told him, ask for anything. Like just ask me for anything you desire. 
Solomon asked God for wisdom. He said, Lord, I want to be able to make the right decisions to lead your people well. And God was so pleased with him. You know, it's, it's, it's so interesting because he, the, the, in fact, here, let me read it how he said it in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 7 to 9. He says that, the, he said to God, now Lord God, you've made your servant king in place of my father David, but I'm only a little child. I don't know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you've chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. And then he says, so give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? And so, I mean, he's, he, he makes an incredible ask. Many young people would have asked for money. Many young people would have asked for what? Like, Cars, phones, fame, wealth. But he doesn't ask for any of that. He says, give me wisdom. Now God was extremely pleased with him. And he made Solomon the wisest man who ever lived. And in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29, we read, it says this about him. It says, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breath of understanding as measureless as the sun on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the East, greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including, and these are probably the, like the smartest guys of the time, Ethan the Ezraite, wiser than Haman, Kalkol, and Dada, the sons of Mahol, and his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs. His songs numbered 1,005. He spoke about plant life from the cedar of Lebanon, to the high soap that grows out of walls. He also spoke about animals and birds and reptiles and fish. From all the nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who heard of his wisdom. Wow. I mean, this is basically telling us Solomon was so wise and knowledgeable that, I mean, all the people in the world, like the kings of the world sent people to come and not to admire his money, or to admire his prosperity, because he was also the wealthiest among them. But they came to hear his wisdom. Like, it wasn't just wisdom about spiritual things. It wasn't like just sermons that the guy was preaching. I mean, this guy was a spoken word artist and a botanist. I mean, he was a singer, songwriter, and a zoologist. I mean, if there's anyone in this world who could say, God, thank you for information. Thank you for common sense. Thank you for the wisdom to know what to do. Solomon was the guy. I mean, this guy was like... He was, he was everything in one package. If anyone had the license to go out and make decisions based on their own intuition, their own wisdom, their own judgment, it was Solomon. And yet here's what I find interesting about him. When Solomon addresses the question of how do we make good decisions, the man who has all the knowledge, the man who has all the wisdom of his time, how do we not get into train wrecks? How do we make the best decisions? Here's what he says. He says in Proverbs chapter 3, and this is an interesting passage. Proverbs 3, 5 to 7. This is one of the, the Proverbs he wrote. He says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Now, let me pause there first and say that this is the wisest, most knowledgeable person, man in his day. The man who could confess to having all the understanding and the wisdom and the insight to make the best decisions. He's, he's an incredible combination because, I mean, think about it. It's like the greatest scientist of his day who's also a famous artist and also a successful national leader. So it's like, what, what, what's like a successful national leader? It's like an Obama, Elon Musk, and like some huge artist. What's your, like, what's your big artist? It's like combine those three and make them one. And it's like this guy is famous, he's smart, and he's rich. And he has the good sense and foresight to have gotten there. And in addition to that, he's a national leader. So add an Obama in that mix. I mean, it's like he, he's so... So he's, he's so all that, but then he gets to the place where he admits that even he cannot afford to lean on his own understanding. He's like, guys, don't trust yourself. Don't trust what you have. Don't trust your experience. Don't trust what you know. Lean not on your own understanding, but trust in the Lord. I mean, that's profound when you think about it, isn't it? Because our natural tendency is to make decisions based on our experiences and on our way of seeing the world. Ever seen, I mean, it's like we always saying things like the way I see it or the way I've always done it or, or can I tell you what I did in the past? It's like we, we rely on what we've done 
And we rely on our experience. We rely on our strength. We say to ourselves, you know, I studied finance. So me, I know this thing. I know how this thing works. Or I've been, I've been in this job for a long time, longer than other people. I know how these things work. I've been in business. For, do you know how long I've been in business? I know how to run a business. I've brought myself this far in life. So I've got this. And that's kind of like the attitude we have as modern day people. It's like, I've got this. And what Solomon is saying is, I know you're smart. I know you've read books. I know you've done the courses. I know you have the experience. But that's not what you depend on. He's, he's like, even with all your tools, even with all your work experience, even with all your education, please don't make this mistake of relying on yourself when it comes to the big life decisions. Never think you're old enough, uh, you're too old or wise enough or smart enough or experienced enough to know how to run your life. Whether it's your relationships, whether it's your faith, whether it's your health, whether it's your finances, you must learn to daily make the decision to depend on God's wisdom. And what is, saying, what, what is Solomon saying? He's saying the answer to life is not more information. It's not what you need. It's not more exposure. It's not more people knowing you. It's not more experience. If you want to always make the right decisions in life every time, it's about you getting up early in the morning, committing every day to God, telling him about all the meetings you have lined up for that day, confessing that all your vast knowledge about those things are nothing compared to what he has for you. Relying on him daily to give you the answers to the conversations you're about to enter. Yeah, you might have a game plan, but you bring that game plan to him in the morning. And you say, I have a strategic plan. I have a game plan. I have a, I have a tender. I have a plan here of things I want to do at work. But Lord, these things are not going to work unless you give me the wisdom. And it's like, I'm not going to prop myself on what I know. I'm choosing to trust in what you are going to teach me. You know, it's, 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 it's such a powerful lesson to learn because it's like saying, even in your marriage, say for instance, you've done the class, you've done the marriage class, your marriage has worked, you've, you're even a mentor for other couples. You've read the books, you've attended the seminars. You know what I'm saying, huh? But even with all that, it's like waking up and saying, Lord, I'm a learner. Show me how to learn to love my wife. Show me how to love my husband. I don't want to rely on what I know. You help me. And coming to life with that attitude, it's like that single person saying, I think, I, I think I've got game. I think I'm an attractive person. I even think I know the kind of people I'm attracted to. I kind of know what marriage I want. But Lord, I don't have this. You're the one who has it. You lead me. Show me what's best for me. It's, it's saying, God, I'm going to trust your wisdom about my finances, not what the world tells me. I'm not going to follow around and see what other people are doing. I'm going to come daily to you and ask you for wisdom for my finances, for my relationships, for my education, for my money. I'm going to ask you to help my, me plan my projects for the day. I'm going to help you give me your wisdom to make all my direction, uh, to, to receive my direction. And that's what it means. This is basically what it means to trust the Lord with all your heart. It means I'm putting aside what I know and I'm asking God to show me what he wants for my life. And here's a promise that he gives. Why, why do such a radical thing? Why would a smart person like Solomon teach such a, a radical thing? Because here's what he says happens. He says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Now, I like that phrase, he will make your path straight. Because here's what I really think happens. Huh? When you start leaning on all your experience and all the knowledge out there, you basically get lots of contradictory information that leads you to be overwhelmed. And you find your path begins to get crooked. You know, your paths begin to get crooked because it's like they take, you don't even know what direction to take because there are so many good directions you could take in. And you end up in what many people call the paralysis of analysis. It's like, you're so, it's like there's so many things you could do and all of them, you have no idea how they're going to end out. And what happens is direction makes that decision is when you make that decision to trust your life to God. Not just your faith and your church life, but every area you trust to him. And, and it doesn't start when you've got a crisis facing you. It starts even when you're starting that journey. It's like even before you enter that business deal, it's like I'm already praying about this business. It's like it begins when I daily surrender my business. And here's what happens. There's something that surrender does in life's, uh, when you're finding direction for life, it activates, it's almost like this supernatural navigation system <laughs> that is not accessible to everybody. And all of a sudden you have access to wisdom that you never would have had. And this is what I'm really seeing that Solomon is teaching us here because he's saying surrender activates supernatural navigation. It's like there's this supernatural navigation that becomes clear. It's almost like everybody else is operating on a map, but you have Google Maps. It's like you're ahead of everybody else because you're in a supernatural plane. You rise to a plane that nobody else is operating in. Now, more information 
it's not what you need. I want to tell you that. Uh, some of you have just been thinking, if I just got more education, I'd be happier. If I just understood more things, I would. In fact, many times information leaves you overwhelmed. And without surrender, you're going to be left stuck in the realm of earthly wisdom. And the realm of earthly wisdom is a dangerous realm because many people who rely on earthly wisdom, they receive earthly results. And earthly results is broken marriages. I mean, how many people do you know who are rich and smart and have broken marriages? It's like it just seems to go with the territory, right? That's the result that you see when people rely on earthly wisdom. Uh, wealth with great sorrow. You receive the wealth, yes, but you receive misery and other things that come with it because it didn't really build you the way it should. Lack of health, lack of balance, emptiness, lack of purpose, not understanding your spiritual purpose. All these things happen when you rely on human wisdom. But when you surrender to God, it's like that hidden gear. It just helps you operate and move into a whole new level. Because you see, God is saying he makes your path straight. Where you'd have meandered for years to get to the place you're going, God gives you a straight path to the place that he created you for. And in verse 7, Solomon says something even really amazing because he caps this by saying, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil because this will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. You see, God doesn't want you relying on your gut instincts, on your experience. Because compared to your wisdom, they will actually result in evil. What can be called evil? They will not give you health. They will actually end up with, you'll end up with a space where you've achieved everything you want and you find it was too little. You live for small things. Have you ever had this phrase of climbing the ladder of success only to find it was leaning against the wrong wall? And this is what happens when you lean on your own understanding. But he says, listen, when you don't trust in yourself, then God gives you health. He gives you healthy outcomes, nourishment to your bones. And Solomon calls it health to your body, nourishment to your bones. This is really what he's saying. Surrender activates supernatural navigation. I want us to read that passage in the message um, uh, paraphrase. The message is a paraphrase of the, uh, of the Bible. And a paraphrase really means it's not a, it's not a formal translation, but it's more like a, a sense of what the, the Bible says. And it's the same proverb, Proverbs 3, verse 5. And here's what it says. It says, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God. Run from evil. Your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. Can you see that picture? It's like your bones are vibrating with life. You're full of health, even in your old age, because the decisions you made were the right decisions and you can look back to life without regret. Now I want to conclude, but as I do, here's a couple of things I want to challenge you as we go out into this week. Number one, I'd like you to invite, I'd like to invite you to join our, our community for 4.30 a.m. prayers. And uh, you can go on the Mavuno Church website, www.mavunochurch.org. Uh, the links are there for, uh, for, our prayer, for how we pray every morning, 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. East Africa time. You can join one of our communities and, jo and join us for prayer. And you know what? Uh, and, and it's not just about getting there on time. I want to actually, this is what I want to do. And some of you already joined us for 4.30. So here's what I want you to do different this week. I want you to get there, not at 4.30 when we're starting, but get there like 10 minutes before. And in that 10 minutes, I want you to just listen, be ready. Don't get there in a rush. Like be there so that you're ready for prayer. But in the 10 minutes as you wait, start to list down all the things ahead of you in that day. What does your day look like? What meetings are you going to be in? What conversations are you going to be in? What critical conversations are you going to have? What decisions do you have to make? What travel are you going to be involved in? So it's like list all the things in your day. And then during the prayer time, this will become a guide for you about some of the things you need to be bringing to God. And use that time to confess your own limited wisdom in the meetings that are coming, to confess how much you, 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 you easily depend on yourself and yet you need to depend on God, to thank God because His wisdom is available. And then when it comes to time to pray, then just pray over every one of those aspects. Ask God to give you the best outcome. Ask Him to empty your mind of your own thoughts and ideas and instead to fill you with His divine wisdom. You know, I, I really have found this to be a powerful practice. For example, just imagine you're going to meet your co-workers or your employees uh, tomorrow morning. And what you do is then you submit every agenda of that meeting to God. And you ask Him to lead you. 
if you're going to meet your spouse or just hang out with your spouse at any point, ask him to show you something you can do to love and honor her. Something or him. And it's something that may not even be in your mind, but ask God, God, give me a beautiful interaction with my spouse tomorrow. And then also show, I mean, maybe if you're going to interact with your kids, ask God to give you wisdom so that every interaction will be a lifelong impact impartation. Something that will really bless their lives. And you know what? Just give it to God in the beginning of the morning and say, God, to, uh, tell God, I'm engaging the spiritual gear here because surrender activates supernatural uh, navigation. I don't know if you're with me. Are you, are you understanding what we're talking about? So point number one is this whole week, get into prayer early, prepare for prayer. And then number two, second thing, as you meet your discipleship group, for those of you who are in a discipleship group, I want you in the four areas of, of life that we've been examining with this series. Uh, it's our faith, our relationships, our health, and our finances. Take every one of those and just ask, where is it that I'm relying on my own strength and wisdom? And what do I need to start doing to let go and to let God in those areas? So we'll have that conversation and maybe make some decisions uh, that will help you begin to activate that supernatural navigation. Because we say this, surrender activates supernatural navigation. Can I pray for us? Dear Jesus, I thank you so much for this amazing day. Thank you for a beautiful time in your presence. Thank you for your word. Your word is so amazing. And I know that today there are people whose lives have been transformed because of this word. I thank you that some of us are in that place where we do desperately need your wisdom. In fact, all of us are in that place. And I pray that, Lord, as we listen to this word, I pray for somebody here who has realized that their life is not submitted to God, that they are really the ones leading in the driving seat of their life. And I pray that, Lord, even as you reveal that to them, that, Lord, you would give them the grace now to step down and to let you. And Lord, to understand that they're, as long as they keep driving, as long as the ones who are in the seat, then their life will always give earthly results. But Father, I know that what they desire is supernatural results. So I just pray that Lord, as we surrender ourselves this week, you're going to give us the wisdom to always live that surrendered lifestyle. I also pray for somebody here who doesn't know you and maybe they already have been on the driver's seat of their own life. And right now, even as we speak this message, they're realizing in the most fundamental area of my life, my own life, I'm the one who's in control. And maybe today you've understood this and you're like, I, I do need to first start by giving my life to Jesus so he can be in charge of my life. If this is you and you'd like to give your life to Jesus, pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I come to you today to surrender my life to you. Forgive my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to follow you. From this day forward, I am saved. I'm your child and I'm under your control. Lead me to the purpose you created me for. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, we are so excited for you. Uh, please send, uh, an, uh, just send, send me an email on that little uh, link that you can see, the email that's on the screen. Uh, send, use that to send me an email. Let me know and we'll be happy to just send you some information to help you take the next step and the next step to become everything that God created you for. So I can't wait to see you uh, next week. We're going to be concluding this series and introducing the series for the next week. And uh, until that time, may God bless you. May he keep you. May he fill you with wisdom. May you understand how to make good decisions every time. And may you move in that place where you're in a different plane from the people around you, not operating with earthly wisdom, but with supernatural navigation. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God's people say, Amen.